So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Apollo and Dionysus. They're, they're really complementary in a way that no other gods except maybe, a, I don't know, Athena and Ares are or something like that. We'll start with Apollo because this is a nice segue from what we talked about last time. We pretty much ended with um, Artemis. And so Apollo is uh, her brother. And so they were both born on the same island of Delos in the middle of things, just about literally between east and west and almost really even between north and south of, of the Aegean area. So very symbolically in the middle of things, probably not a coincidence. There was enough geographical knowledge when this myth started going around about the birth of Apollo and Artemis for it to have been chosen, most likely, as a symbolic center of things for the good reason that we will see when we get to the shrine most often associated with Apollo, that is, in Delphi, considered to be the navel of the universe, according to myth, that where Apollo is the patron, in the same way that Athena is the patroness of Athens and Poseidon of Corinth, etc. So we talked last time about how when you identify Apollo and Artemis, the one thing they tend to have in common is a bow and arrow. And when in, in the case of Artemis, it's always the case, okay? To the extent to where if you ever see something uh, that supposedly depicts Artemis without a bone arrow, there's going to be a reason. You know, it's going to be parody. It's going to be, you know, some, some riff on the usual way of identifying Artemis. That's how indispensable the bow and arrow is to Artemis as an identifier. Not the case with Apollo. Apollo, most often you'll see him with a bow and arrow for the reasons we talked about last time, but we'll review that in a second. But then sometimes not, because sometimes you'll see him with a lyre, kind of the ancient equivalent to a harp, because he's the god not only of shooting arrows at people to get back at them when they have been bad, for want of a better word, um, but also he's the god uh, most often associated with inspiring um, artists to do what they do in conjunction with the muses, daughters of Zeus and of Minamasini, the titaness whose name means memory. Okay, so Zeus has kids with memory, and then from them come the muses. And Apollo is buddies with the muses, kind of in the same way that um, Eros slash Cupid, if you go to Rome, is with Aphrodite. Okay, so sometimes an Olympian will have a sidekick that will kind of hang with them, kind of like a Batman Robin thing in a way, um, that kind of idea. At least that's the archetype for that idea of the sidekick. Okay, now let's run down kind of a review from the reading of a few things about Apollo that we should definitely associate with him just about indispensably or without exception. First one, and the one that a lot of people make a mistake about, is a lot of people, and every semester one or two people ask me, is Apollo the sun god? No. Okay, he's not the sun god. The sun god, very clearly, is Helios. Helios means sun in ancient Greek. Apollo is not the same as sun, but he's associated with the sun. He's associated more abstractly with the idea of light, and then even more abstractly with the idea of reason, okay? with the idea of the aspect of human beings in charge of calculation and thinking of things in a somewhat systematic, analytical way. Now, this is going to be in sharp contrast with Dionysus, so don't forget that's kind of where we're leading up to. Okay? So from the very outset, we can think of Apollo and Dionysus as opposites, and the way I want to start today to kind of point that out, underscore it, and historicize it, you know, so you guys see that it's not just coming out of the blue or from some minor tradition or even the most major tradition in the ancient world, but rather it comes from the modern world in the late 1800s from a philosopher that you've all heard of. I don't know, you're all familiar with him to a more or less degree, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, okay? The guy from what today is called Germany. Um, back then it was not Germany yet, okay, the Prussian Empire. All right, so late 1800s, 70s, 80s, Nietzsche taught classics. He taught ancient, about ancient Greece and Rome, and then by extension he was a philosopher. And um, so in what we'll call Germany, it wasn't Germany yet, but we'll call it Germany. In Germany, he um, taught classics, and his dissertation was called The Birth of Tragedy. Okay, and what it was was an argument that those from his times who in his opinion, were pretty much the best classicists of all time. So that's another way of saying, you know, the best classicists of all time made a big mistake. 
a big glaring mistake that he sought in his dissertation to correct. And that is, in his opinion, there was an overemphasis on what he called the Apollonian aspects of ancient Greece. Okay, Apollonian is nothing but an adjective coming from the name Apollo. Okay, so the Apollo-related aspects of things. Okay, before I get deeper into what he meant by that, let me tell you that he contrasted the Apollonian aspects of reality that he thought was overdone by classicists who looked at ancient Greece. In other words, focused on that stuff um, at the expense of what he considered to be its opposite, which was the Dionysian aspects of reality. And for Nietzsche, what was wrong with this was, first of all, I don't know how everybody, we all have a different historical frame to put these things in, so I don't know how much historical knowledge I can assume in, in, in y'all. So I'll kind of throw a little bit out there in case you, you don't know these things. We start in the 18th century with the so-called Age of Enlightenment, right? After, so you have, the, you have the Renaissance, you have the uh, Reformation, um, and then eventually you have the formation of modern nation states. And then you, in the 18th century, you get guys like Newton, Leibniz, and various others who started to believe that, among other things, mathematics, and in particular calculus, and analytical geometry were getting so advanced that those in the vanguard of researching math and researching philosophy started to believe and argue that it was possible for human beings via reason to figure out the whole universe. Okay, that it was possible for everything to be understood by means of reason. Okay? That's pretty much where it all began when it comes to what Nietzsche, let's call it um, 150 years later, would look back at and say, oops, you guys really erred here, okay? Because you're over focusing on reason and on rationality when it comes to coming to terms with what is most significant about human beings, why human beings bother studying ancient Greece and Rome in the first place, which, by the way, in those times was a lot more common than it is in our time. You know, people knew Greek and Latin a lot more commonly than they do now, so it was considered to be much more important than it is now overall in our society. So hopefully you guys are all to some extent familiar with what I'm talking about. Age of Reason or the Enlightenment is how, how it's sometimes referred to. Guys like Voltaire and Leibniz as well, referred to in Candide by Voltaire. What in the West cultural movement followed the Enlightenment slash Age of Reason that is most famous, uh, you know, kind of a reaction to the Age of Reason? The Romantic period in the 19th century, right, the 1800s, okay? So we're talking 1700s, age of reason, this idea that the whole universe, starting pretty much with Newton, uh, could be figured out via reason. And that was all that needed to be done. Once you could do that, you're pretty much in touch with God, okay? According to them, the idea was God pretty much set everything, created everything, and then set it in motion. And, and you could predict the way the universe works like a clock, okay? And it was actually a metaphor that Newton used you know, Newton's clock, okay? Then in the 19th century, 1800s, in England, in France especially, came the Romantics. First it's the painters and the poets, guys like in England, William Blake at Rousseau in France, criticized this idea that what was most significant about reality and what was most significant to study in the humanities, in uh, history and culture, etc., was what can be determined via reason, via, via the faculty of reason. And they argued that just as important as reason was the emotions. That's what the Romantic movement was all about, this idea that, hey, you guys are really missing out on something here. You know, you need to not ignore the aspect of human beings that, in their opinion, transcended reason and that dealt with aspects of reality that were much more profound than what can be kind of determined through calculation and through uh, an analysis and, in general, through reason. Okay? That was all, the, all that stuff happened before Nietzsche came along. And then Nietzsche kind of, at least in his own mind, tied it all together with his dissertation, The Birth of Tragedy, in which he argued, hey, you guys, Enlightenment first and then the Romantic period, what you guys are arguing about is something that all you have to do is go back even, pull the camera back even further and look at the ancient Greeks, the very ones that the Renaissance looked back on and considered themselves to have been a rebirth of, that's what Renaissance means, right? And you will discover that the ancient Greeks were already in touch with this, with a balance between these things that you fools were focusing on one more than the other, and then with the Romantics, one more than the other. You got me? So first of the Enlightenment, 
in, according to Nietzsche, there was an overemphasis on, on reason. Then with the Romantics, according to Nietzsche, there's an overemphasis on emotion. Nietzsche said, wait a minute, you guys are out of whack. If you need to look at the Greeks, the Greeks were already in touch with the balance. But the problem is that those who have interpreted the Greeks, and we'll call it Greeks for now, kind of Romans too, but it was mostly the Greeks that he was focused on. He was a Hellenist, so he's into the Greeks. He said the Greeks were in touch with the balance, and the balance is embodied in the contrast that they were very conscious of between Apollo and Dionysus. The ancient Greeks were very aware of this contrast between the two and conflict between the two, but then a kind of um, resolution of that conflict by recognizing that Apollo had certain aspects of reality that he was in charge of, and Dionysus had certain aspects that he was in charge of. And it was this, this um, conflict that was eventually resolved and then there was a, a nice complementarity between um, Apollo and Dionysus that was, in, in Nietzsche's opinion, the most revolutionary thing, culturally speaking, about what the uh, Greeks discovered. Okay? It was that human beings are a lot more complex than either purely reason or either purely emotion. Okay? Then, don't get me started, after Nietzsche, after Nietzsche dies and Freud comes along with the notion of the subconscious, you know, aspects of human beings, that, that are impossible to understand on a conscious level. There's things lurking beneath the surface that, that have to be teased out through psychoanalysis and all that stuff. That's, that's on the side of psychoanalysis. But then don't forget about modern physics, right? Heisenberg, uh, fans of uh, Breaking Bad. That, you know, Heisenberg was a giant deal, all joking aside. Okay? Um, and and he, he's the guy in modern physics, uh, among others who um, found, you know, discovered that you can't really measure things accurately on the subatomic level because as soon as you are imposing your um, perspective and, and your observation on those things, they change in a way that, that they're different than the things that you set out to analyze in the first place. You know, so, so there's that weird paradox where every time you look at something, it changes because by looking at it, you can only look at it by means of light or whatever, then it gets a little more complex than that. We'll call it light for now. And then by doing that, you have a reaction because of that light, and then the very thing you sought out to look at, you can look at it. What does it all mean? What does it all mean? It all comes down to that as time goes on, especially after World War I, right? That was a big watershed historically where before World War I, check out Barbara Tuchman's book, The Time Right Before World War I, in the West was a world where it was believed that it was pretty much an extension of the Newtonian universe, where even though, yeah, the Romantics came along and said it's so important that emotions need to be taken into consideration, there was still this belief that the world was manageable. The world was, you know, the people were predictable enough to where there might one day be a heaven on earth, you know, um, among human society and all that. World War I Fs up the, the broth, okay? Then after World War I, the Roaring Twenties, yippee, everything's great, everything, oh, we're back, oh, thank gosh. That was the war to end all wars, World War I, right? Then some time goes by, then you have the Depression, then World War II, oh my gosh. You know, so then a bunch of philosophers, nihilists, and, and others like that, kind of, in some sense, uh, Nietzsche-like philosophers, but even darker, who started talking about how it's all ish. I mean, you like look at a guy in France, uh, Sartre, right? The the existentialists, okay, not just in France, but in Germany, etc. You get a lot of philosophers who are into the idea that it's hopeless and that life sucks and you give it up and forget it. You really got that bad, okay? Then Camus came along and said, no, no, don't kill yourself because you have to make your own reality and you have to have some faith that that you know, um, even though it's completely seemingly random, it's all okay. So all this stuff that I just threw at you is a way to kind of try, in a thumbnail way, to come to terms with what Nietzsche is driving at. Okay, Nietzsche, to go back to this idea of the Newtonian universe, is dealing with a world where, and again, classics was a big deal in his time. He was saying, no, we have to undo this overemphasis on the Apollonian aspects of reality and focus at least as much, if not more, on the Dionysian aspects. Okay, So that is all one long prelude to stepping back, putting our minds in ancient Greece before Nietzsche came along thousands of years later, and asking ourselves, what the hell does Apollo mean and what does Dionysus mean? Okay, And so that's the idea. So what does Apollo mean? We already got a hint. We already got a hint of it when we talk about him being the god of 
art, the god of music, the god of the ordered arrangement of sounds, you know, by means of instruments that are kind of primitive versions of modern harps and harpsichords and things like that. Okay, that's what Apollo is about. He's about art that has rhyme and reason to it. He's about art that has system to it, you know, and theory to it. Okay, so when you talk about something like music theory, you're talking about, you're, you're being Apollonian. You're talking about that, okay? What about Dionysus? Okay, and we're going to backtrack um, because we definitely have to focus more on Apollo's connection to Delphi and all that. But let's just jump ahead to Dionysus as a contrast with Apollo in this respect and ask what he represents if Apollo is all about um, art that is calculable and measurable and, and um, predictable and all that kind of stuff, what's Dionysus about? Well, the first hint is, as you know from the reading, he is the god of wine. Apollo is not the god of any inebriatory substance. All right? Now, he is associated with a um, priestess who, as you saw in the movie 300, gets high on fumes. All right? So the only way that she's able to get the answers that the petitioner at the Oracle of Delphi needs from Apollo, who's behind it all, is to get wasted on fumes. Okay, So there is a connection with Apollo when it comes to psychotropic substances, um, but nothing in particular. It's nothing like Dionysus with, with, with wine or Demeter with the poppy. Okay, So the, they're the ones, they're the earth deities that you have to think of in connection uh, with that kind of stuff. Okay. So what about Dionysus? What's he all about? Is he also a god that is concerned with art? Was he a patron of human art? Yes, just like Apollo is, but a different approach to art, a different aspect of art. And the most conspicuous illustration of what Dionysus represents on an artistic level is the fact that there is a very genre of literature slash performance that Dionysus was considered to have been the patron god of. He's the god of what? Besides wine. Drama. He's the god of drama and then more particularly tragedy. Okay? Yeah, drama incorporated tragedy and comedy, but comedy, every, even though the most famous practitioner of it, um, named Aristophanes in the fourth century BC, was kind of a deep thinker. There was some pretty deep stuff going on in his comedies. In general, when you think about Dionysian art, when you think of the kind of art that Nietzsche suggested that his compatriots in Germany, quote, you know, not quite Germany yet, should pay attention to and focus on and recognize as great in a way that should be more emphasized than what was going on in his time, you think of tragedy. Okay, so tragedy is the art form par excellence that we should associate with Dionysus. So what we should ask is what's the difference between the art form slash genre that we associate with Apollo and the art form slash genre that we associate with Dionysus. Anybody know the genre of poetry that is most often associated with Apollo, and it's not epic? Lyric poetry. Remember that day that we did an overview of ancient Greek history, and we talked about how new ways of gaining wealth led eventually, among other things, to democracy, with quotes around it? Well, the development of lyric poetry occurred at the same time as the development of the kinds of art that was eventually considered to be important enough to be tradable for weapons that led to more and more people getting weapons and um, being formidable against those who in the past were the only ones who had weapons, the king and his retainers, etc. And so around the time that those vases that I told you guys about, those, those vases that had religious purport for the Greeks and that were being traded to those who were rich enough to be able to give up their surplus of weapons in exchange for them in order to assure that their relatives would be buried properly and that their souls would be, you know, go on to the afterlife in a, in a favorable way. Remember all that stuff? Okay. Around that same time, the very first lyric poetry was, was emerging. Okay. Now, what does lyric poetry mean? We talk about Homer, okay, who we're going to, you know, pretty much he's going to be the hero of this class. We're going to eventually lead up to Homer after we get through all the pre-Homeric heroes and stuff like that. But he's too important not to mention throughout the whole semester, really. We have lots of kind of spoilers about Homer. And one of those is that Homer's genre was epic poetry. Okay, epic poetry. That is poetry dealing with events that are in some way or another rooted in, at least supposedly, in history. Okay, legend 
right, is in some ways, when it comes to subject matter, synonymous with what Epic is about. Okay? All right. You move on into the seventh century, the time, the archaic period. You guys remember that stuff? The Noan, Mycenaean, Dark Age was, was the three parts of Greek prehistory. Then you get into archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. We didn't talk much about Hellenistic yet. We will when we get to the hero Jason. But archaic and classical, we talked about how Homer initiated the archaic period. That's epic. Okay, that's epic. And that's about the Trojan War, which occurred around the Mycenaean period, about 500 years before Homer. So think of Homer and Hesiod, the guy responsible for the theogony that we learned where the gods came from and how Zeus became the king of the gods. All that stuff is from the archaic period, the first of three of the historical periods per se. Remember that? One, two, three, and one, two, three. All right? It's the tail end of that first period. Okay, so you have the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. You have Homer, just about at the, and Hesiod, just about at the beginning of the archaic period around 750 BC. And then moving on into the 8th century BC, so 740, 730, 725, 720. You start getting these developments we're talking about, okay? You get the kind of art that is traded for the weapons, slowly but surely leading to more and more people being armed and being a force to be reckoned with, with those in power who were the only ones in the past who could afford weapons. And then along the same trajectory, culturally, you have the beginning of a new kind of poetry called lyric. Whereas Homeric and Hesiodic poetry, especially Homeric, well, you see it as kind of not quite epic, so we'll stick mainly with Homer. In Homeric poetry, you're dealing with events that occurred about 500 years earlier, 1250 BC in the Mycenaean period. When you get into this archaic period and you move after Homer into a new kind of poetry called lyric, and this is all going to segue into Dionysus, don't worry. What's happening is, rather than having a poet like Homer, a poor guy, a real poor guy, sitting in the Megaron, the main room of a palace surrounded by a bunch of aristocrats, including the king, listening to him sing, kind of like Mozart in Amadeus in the court of the king, if you, think of, if you remember that scene, kind of like that kind of thing, or more than one scene, I guess. Now what you have is you have the same court setting, you have the same fancy aristocratic setting, and you have the same one poet sitting there singing. But now instead of singing about the Trojan War, you have this one poet sitting there singing about what? Pretty much the equivalent of what's on the radio. Well, not anymore. Songs on the radio. Songs that have kind of a story to them on the radio. Okay, that's kind of what's going on. One person singing about him or herself to the audience. And his or her problems, concerns, emotional situation. Okay? So, so that's, what, that's lyric poetry from the very beginning. Sappho is the, one of the most famous of, of the lyric poets, not only because she's female, um, and not only because she's a lesbian from the island of Lesbos, after which the word lesbian comes, the island that she was from, but also because, oh, she's one of the greatest damn um, artists of all time of anybody, okay, included, mentioned in the same breath as Shakespeare by none other than Ezra Pound, who is mentioned in the same breath by T.S. Eliot as Shakespeare, if you get my drift, okay? And why do we know about Sappho? Or I should say, why do we know about her most famous poem, without which we would probably not think of her as great of a poet as, she, as we think of her as, because it's one poem is insane, to Aphrodite, asking her to help her with her pain for falling in love slash lust with, with a, a woman. From one wrapping of a mummy in Egypt, that's how we have a copy of the most famous and important poem by Sappho. In other words, she was non-canonical. In other words, she wasn't allowed, her voice, if we want to get dramatic about it, wasn't allowed to survive by those who were given the authority to determine what works survived and what works didn't. So it all started in the classical period and then it went most famously into the Hellenistic period and it came to those who were kind of the gatekeepers of culture. Okay, that's what you had. That's what you had. Now these days, it's more of a supply and demand thing. But in those days, it was a matter of who was considered to be the best and the most important cultural representatives by those in power. Okay, And that goes for tragedy as well, which we're going to um, get into today as well. Okay, and, and, and it's the same situation. There's only three tragedians out of scores of them, almost a hundred really great ones. Um, there are only three 
whose works survived, some of whose works survived complete. And that goes in, you know, along with what I told you guys earlier about how we can't go get too big of a head in our attempt to come to terms with what was really going on in ancient Greece and Rome, but especially ancient Greece. You know, we're very limited in the documents that we have available to us, mainly because of the gatekeeper phenomenon. Okay, no one ever talks about it. Why? Because it's too it's too neat and and pat to be able to buy coffee table books and pretend that we know how great the Greeks were in every aspect of their life. Right? We know why not? Because we have one example of just about everything that they did. We at least you know we have several tragedies, we have several comedies, we have several lyric poems, we have several epics, we have why not pretend that those are not only representatives of those genres, but you know, that there was a flourishing um, trade in all these different things. Uh, and it's true, there was, but the, what is never mentioned is that the others that were going on, their competitors, and so in some cases their superiors, we don't have their works because they weren't allowed, uh, their voices weren't allowed to, to be heard. Anyway, there's lyric poetry, and that's the poetry. The one person singing about his or her emotions is the poetry associated most often with Apollo. And it, it was accompanied by a lyre, L-Y-R-E, which is the ancient equivalent of a harp. You have this one person playing the lyre, and singing about his or her emotions to, to a crowd. There were different subgenres of lyric poetry. One of those subgenres was called choral poetry. This is before drama. We're talking still in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, in the archaic period. One subgenre of lyric poetry was called choral poetry, and what it consisted of was instead of one person singing to a bunch of people about his or her emotions, okay, what, what concerned him or her on a personal level, personal poetry is another way to put it. Now you had several people standing together or sitting together and singing in unison the same exact poem. And it tended to also have a personal subject matter. Just like you may have been in a chorus in grammar school, in the auditorium, you know, a bunch of people singing uh, as a chorus. The only difference being that as time goes on, the music gets more complex and you start having counterpoint and harmony and you know different people singing with different voices and there being kind of a counterpoint between the voices rather than everybody singing the same thing. But in ancient Greece, a chorus unequivocally, this is a, one of the few undisputable historical facts about um, lyric poetry, the choral poet poetry was sung, always sung, not, not spoken, always sung with everybody singing the exact same thing. Then supposedly near the tail end of the archaic period, leading on into the classical, but not quite there yet, okay, in the 500s something, so 6th century BC, moving on into maybe 550 or so. Supposedly, okay, this is probably a, an apocryphal story. Apocryphal is a synonym for boldish. It's probably a boldish story, but why not? There was a dude one day who was in a chorus, and as the chorus was singing the same thing as usual, da 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 da, -da going together, singing together, this one guy stepped out of the chorus, waited for the chorus to finish what it was singing in unison, and then said, I don't think that's true. Or in one way or another responded to what the chorus was singing in unison. And now, in other words, he provided a second voice, a voice that was in contrast. In one way or another, nobody knows exactly what he's saying or even if this guy really exists in the first place. But that's the story for the ancient Greeks, and that's what we learn in here is we try to get inside their heads what they believed. Okay? And so this guy stood outside and responded to what the chorus was singing, and that was, as far as history is concerned, the very first actor. That's where acting was invented. Bunch of people singing in the chorus, everybody's content with this one voice, this one unison voice in 6th century BC, 7th century and 6th century BC, even 8th century, singing the same thing, same thing. Then one day, one guy stands out, responds to them, everybody you know, is aghast. They're like, what are you doing? You just messed it up. Messed up the, the song. We have to start all over again. No, no, you might have something here. And then who knows what, what followed that. Anybody know the name of this guy? We have a word in English, thespian, that means good at acting. Someone who's a thespian is a good actor. Okay. So Thespis, around 530 BC, you have this guy standing outside, and that was the first actor. And that's the beginning of not only acting, but of drama. So now you have this new way of doing things where you have one actor and a chorus. And that's how drama began. One actor and a bunch of people singing together. And there was an interaction one between them. And luckily, we have one play 
just about in its entirety by the first of the three big tragedians, that is, those who write tragedies, you know, dramatists, from ancient Athens, and it's by Aeschylus, and I'll give you the names of those, the three guys as we go. But because of this one play, we have a sense of what it was like for a drama to consist of nothing but a chorus singing together the same thing, and then one actor responding, and it going on and on and on like that the entire play. All right? Not that exciting. Okay, wasn't well, that exciting. All right? And so that's how drama went on until, and I'll give you the um, historical significance of why it was in this particular uh, period of history, until right after the beginning of the classical period, so in the 5th century BC, which is your classical, classical begins 490 BC because that's the beginning of the Persian Wars, and then there was one tragedian who near the beginning of the classical period named Aeschylus and the innovation that is most often associated with Aeschylus was, and it's going to sound kind of anticlimactic to us maybe, but it wasn't, was to introduce wait for it another actor. That was a big deal because as soon as you have not one actor in a bunch of people in the chorus singing the same thing and this one guy, it was all guys We'll get more to that in a while, too. This one guy singing back to all these people. All of a sudden, Aeschylus says, hey, wait a minute. This is boring. I'm bringing another actor in there, right? And, you know, it sounds kind of almost hilarious, right? It's like, okay, okay, yeah, duh. That was kind of the natural thing to happen. But there was a lot more to it. It wasn't just a matter of the logistics of having two people on stage and one chorus instead of one person and one chorus. But you also had to do something that was a little tricky write a play, write a good play that employed these two actors and this chorus. And the first one that Aeschylus did this with was called The Persians. And it was about the aftermath of the Persian War. That, not coincidentally, is the landmark, the historical landmark that kicked off the beginning of the classical period. Okay, so what we learned that day that we looked at the overview of Greek history, we talked about the centrality of the Persian Wars, about the Persian Empire. Supposedly, this is the way at least the Greeks represented it. The, the Persians getting jealous of the Greeks being so much more culturally and economically and politically superior in their eyes again to the rest of not only Greece but the world and the Persian Empire not being able to take it anymore. They had to punish them for their hubris, this and that. Okay, Whatever the reason for the Persian Wars, that's purely a Western take on it, obviously. The Persian Empire had their own version of it all. But the bottom line is that the Persian Wars that we talked a little bit about on that day was the watershed historically for the classical period being initiated after the archaic, and the Persians is about the aftermath of the Persian War of Marathon, the Battle of Marathon, the, the first of the wars, Greek victory that gave the Greeks the sense that they could beat such a formidable enemy so far from them, etc. That's what Aeschylus used as the subject matter for his first play that featured two actors and the chorus. And so the big deal about this was that he had to be, in a way that no one else had been before him, ingenious in his employment of how these actors work. On the one hand, you might have one actor talking to the other actor, not knowing that the chorus is overhearing them, and then they will talk to the gods about the things that they overheard the two actors talking about, or on the other hand, you have one character talking to the chorus, not knowing that the one other actor is overhearing it, and he's talking to the gods, etc. You have all, as crazy as it is, there's an exponential um, increase in the types of dynamic that can go on between the different actors on the stage once you bring that second actor in. Okay? But then guess what? You got it. You guessed it. The next guy, Sophocles, shortly after Aeschylus, Guess what he did? Yep. He brought in a third actor. And now, oh my gosh, the sky was the limit, right? Now you have two teaming up against one with the chorus taking the side of two or taking the side of the one, right? Or all of them teaming up against the chorus, etc., etc. It goes, you know, it just goes, to, it, like I said, it's an exponential increase in, in dynamics between the different actors. And once that all got set going, then, then um, tragedy became something unlike any other art form that existed in the world. And it was invented by the Athenians. The Athenians, remember, those who were, even more than the Spartans, most important in the 
victory with quotes around it, because later Alexander the Great disagreed that it was really a victory, but we'll call it a victory because they portrayed it to be. Victory over the Persian Empire in the, in the Persian Wars. So that's the idea that it was Athens who invented drama and invented the theater as the site for the enactment of the drama by the, the first the one actor and the chorus, then the two actors in the chorus, and then the three actors in the chorus. Then a third tragedian and a final one that were canonized by the main leader of Athens after the Persian Wars named Pericles, the general who pretty much runs things even though it's a dem democracy. You have to have someone kind of in charge and the one with the army behind him is, is your best bet and that's what we have here. Pericles is the guy that gets to decide which of the tragedians get to live on in posterity so that we can read their plays. And it was these guys, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Aeschylus most famously introduced the second actor, Sophocles the third actor, and then Euripides, guess what? Nope, guess wrong. Ah, that was a trick. Nope, Euripides considered, and everybody else considered, three to be enough, and that was it. Three actors and a chorus was the most you ever had in Greek tragedy. And so Euripides, in order to compete with Sophocles, okay, they were after Aeschylus' time, so Aeschylus came and then came Sophocles and Euripides. In order to compete with Sophocles in terms of, you know, kind of clout um, as an innovator in drama, everybody considered it, including Euripides, considered it to be overdoing it to um, bring a fourth actor on the stage, so Euripides had to innovate in other ways. Most famously, in his portrayal of women as characters in his plays. And most famously, in his play, Trojan Women, dealing with the aftermath of the Trojan War. Trojan War, remember that one? Homer's epic uh, subject matter? It's very, you know, there's a lot of overlap here. And the horrible lives that the Trojan women had to live as slaves once the Greeks had beaten the Trojans in the Trojan War. So what does that mean in a broader sense? It means that Euripides innovated not on a formal level, not when it comes to the structure of how characters interact and how many interact, but rather on the level of subject matter and theme, on the level of what the plays were about. Right? Yes, with Sophocles you quite famously have a few uh, female heroines who are extremely formidable, you know, such as Antigone, who is a full-fledged hero in most people's eyes. Okay, yeah, it's true. But when you get into Euripides, you start dealing with women as characters in at least what Euripides and a few somewhat more enlightened than the average bear Greeks at the time believed to be a more realistic way to depict women. And that was rather than patronize them as heroes on a stage in a context in which women in the real world weren't even allowed to come to the theater to watch these heroes, these female heroes on the stage, depict them rather as suffering the horrible lives that they really lived in ancient Athens. And obviously there was a lot of backlash for that. Okay, And Euripides almost got exiled for it. He didn't, um, but he almost did. But he pretty much hid out away from everybody. When he wrote his plays, he hid out in this, in this uh, cave and he wrote his plays away from everybody and they found a, a cup of Euripides with his name on it in a cave, and it's just, he, he was a pretty heavy dude, pretty cool dude. So, what I'm getting at here is that Euripides, once you get to Euripides as a tragedian, now you start seeing connections between what Nietzsche is talking about when he says that the ancient Greeks were in touch with the Dionysian aspect of things. Because when you're, on, when you're dealing at the very beginning of tragedy with Aeschylus and even to some extent with Sophocles, you're still dealing in the Homeric world of epic. You're dealing with mythology. You're dealing with abstraction and with um, idealization of reality. When you get to Euripides, you're getting into the nitty-gritty of what we would today call psychological realism. You're dealing with horrible pain and, and suffering by the legitimate victims of those who had the power to victimize them. Okay? And, and, and so, so Euripides brought something new into art in general, but you know, um, dramatic art in particular. And for that reason, not only Nietzsche, but also Aristotle, the philosopher in the fourth century BC, also labeled Euripides as, quote, the most tragic 
of the tragedians, the most tragic, not the best necessarily. Okay, because um, Aristotle believed that Sophocles was the best when it comes to plot and, and all that kind of stuff. But Euripides is, is the most tragic. Okay, all right. So now, how does that all relate to Dionysus? Here's how. Nobody knows exactly when and, and the circumstances behind Thespis standing out from the chorus and, and how, it, or even if it really ever did happen. Okay, that stuff is one thing. That has to do with the development of a literary genre, of a performative genre. But the question of theater is another story. So there's drama, the genre, and then there's theater, the venue. Now, the venue is historical. You don't go building buildings without people knowing dates for when the buildings are built if you live in historical times, right? Because that's a big deal, right? There's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of records, a lot of footprints behind the process of building such a thing. And that thing that is most relevant to what we're talking about here was on... The, and we all know the picture. You know that big hill. You know that big temple, the Parthenon, right? Well, right here on the south slope of the hill is a theater. On the south slope of that hill, you know, that has the Parthenon on top of it called the Acropolis, is the theater that was pretty much the only theater at first in which tragedies were performed in Athens in the 5th century BC. And it's called the Theater of Dionysus. It's called that straight out. Why? Because in the same way that mythology accounts for Athens having Athena as its patroness, there's patron god, so from the very outset of this theater being built in 5th century Athens, drama was associated with the god Dionysus. Why? It has everything to do with the types of emotions and what was called catharsis you know, the purgation of emotions that was brought out by those in the audiences of the plays, at least the best ones, okay? And so it's important to know when this theater of Dionysus was built historically. And we are equipped now, because you have a decent idea of relative chronology in ancient Greek history, so that if I tell you that shortly after the third and final and decisive battle of the Persian Wars, the Battle of Salamis in 479 BC. Shortly thereafter, Heracles had the theater of Dionysus built. Why? It's really important to know this. It didn't come out of nowhere. It wasn't ahistorical. It was, there was a historical reason, and it connects with some of the stuff we've been talking about, propaganda. Okay. 479 BC, Persian War is over, or Persian Wars are over, and Athens takes pretty much full credit for the Greek victory over the Persian Empire. Some, some would agree with them for it. You know, they, they certainly played the largest part. Okay? And so you have Pericles telling the rest of Greece straight out, as far as we know from the, the main chronicler of the um, events following the Persian Wars and then leading up to the civil war that would occur um, later between um, Athens and Sparta. According to him, Thucydides, there was this sense that Athens was the big kid on the campus, that Athens was the leader without which the rest of Greece would have to worry about being attacked by the Persian Empire again and probably defeated. Okay. Think of Achilles and how important he was to the Greeks in the Trojan War. That's pretty much the idea behind the Athenians after the Persian Wars. And at least Pericles did the best he could to convince the rest of Greece that this was the case. Pericles, in a very famous funeral speech, funeral speeches were common occurrences for generals in power at a given historical period in, in Greece to reach as many people as they could because it was such an important event that if the person who had been buried was important enough, there would be enough people to make a dent and in getting as many people to listen to him as possible. And that's what he did at this very famous funeral oration. He proclaimed to as many as would listen, which was, as far as we know, hundreds of thousands, kind of like a proto Woodstock. I mean, it was ridiculous, right? And lots and lots of people. He pretty much told, you know, representatives from all over Greece, they were all there, because this was a big, giant deal, funeral of a giant dude, okay? Pretty much told everybody there, hey, you know what? We Athenians, we, without us, you guys would be slaves to Persians. What you all need to do is, number one, recognize that we Athenians are the reason why the Greeks won the Persian Wars. Number two, don't go take it for granted that the Persian Wars are over. They may not be. Okay, now in retrospect, we know that they were, but there's no way for them to know at the time. 
So don't go thinking that it's over. We may have a fourth war with the Persians. So what you guys need to do from all over Greece, take this back to your home. And don't forget, we're at a time when in order to do so, you had to travel hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles by the equivalent of either some kind of um, you know, cart with horses or walking or, you know, you didn't have trains yet. You didn't have airplanes. You know, it took a long time to get back home. So take the, this message back. Y'all need to send a representative from each of your city states all over Greece. If you want to belong to our club, our protection club, other not, otherwise you're on your own. And screw you if the Persians come, the Persian Empire comes. We're not going to protect you. You're not part of our thing. But if you want to be part of our thing, called the Delian League, Okay, that's in the book, but Delian League, D-E-L-I-A-N, League. Pericles said, if you want to be part of this league that we Athenians have started, that will protect you from any future wars with any enemies, Persian Empire or otherwise, you need to come back to Athens every year with a certain amount of money. You know, it was determined, I'll bore you with it, amounts. It was different places, different amounts because of different relationship with Athens, etc., you come every year and bring tribute, which is another word for taxes, every year to Athens. Oh, it first started on a, on a neutral island, and then eventually it was to Athens. And as you come to, to do this, when you come each year in Athens, what we're going to do for you is we're going to give you a return for your money. Not only are we going to protect you and keep you from having to go to war again with the Persians, to the best of our abilities, and defend you if, if we in fact have to, but we're going to put on the most insane show you have ever seen to where you want to come here over here. Okay? And what was that show? It was called the Panathenaic Festival. It was called the Panathenaic Festival. Very symbolically named because Athenaic just means having to do with Athens. Pan means everybody. It means everybody's Athenian. The Everybody is Athenian Festival. Nobody ever calls it that. But that really brings home what we're talking about. Okay? So Pericles says... Every year, we're going to have the, the Everything is Athens festival that all of you from all over Greece are going to come to every year and bring money for the treasury in order for us to use in order to protect Athens and everybody else in Greece. Okay, But our first priority has to be to bolster up Athens after what the Persians did to it in order to make it a, you know, a legitimate capital of all of the places in Greece. Okay, so we're going to have to spend quite a bit of money on Athens itself. But other than that, we're going to protect all of you. And every year you come here, and we're going to put on this show. We're going to put on this festival. And in our times, even more than when I started teaching this stuff however many years ago, now festivals are a giant deal. So think festivals. Think music festivals. Think you know those kind of Burning Man and whatever, all that kind of stuff. That's what we're talking about. That kind of vibe. Okay, and that's that was the. Cauldron. That was the social context in which drama began, is this idea that you had to have a way for those from all over Greece who came to Athens every year to feel like it was worth it enough to, to come there and to pay their tribute. And so it wasn't only a matter to pay the money, but it was also to experience something that there was no way they could experience anywhere else. So it's really the equivalent, imagine, if... Only one state in the Union of the United States had all this stuff that we take for granted in our lives. All this stuff. Movies, TV, cell phones, YouTube, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. Athens was the only one who had all this stuff. And every year, they invited people from all over Greece to come and to experience all these... Kind of like a World Fair kind of vibe, if you guys are aware of that stuff, you know, in, in our history. Um, World Fairs were a big deal with technology, this and that. Athens was that big of a deal, technologically, artistically, not athletically. That was Olympia, okay? That where the Olympics were, okay? They get that. They get sports, all right? We're good with that, all right? Olympia gets sports. Delphi gets oracular activity, okay? Where, where Apollo is, is the main guy. But Athens is all about Athena and Dionysus, okay? Athena for political and military reasons, Dionysus for cultural reasons, in a context where cultural meant a lot more than it might even mean to us now, no matter how much we love culture, because we're talking exclusivity. We're talking no one else had these things. And it's hard for us to imagine until what? Until we look at these Greek tragedies, especially if you read the original Greek, and you get a sense of how insanely, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you the artistry involved in these plays, especially when you read the original Greek 
which I can only compare to if you, you take your very favorite artist, your very favorite whatever, and max it out by 100 or something. And that was the vibe. That was the sense of how special it was to come to Athens every year. And that was the idea behind it. And so that's the historical context for the advent of drama and theater. And in order to drive home how special tragedy was, Greek tragedy as a genre, as a, as a form of making art, was to those all over Greece, Dionysus was a symbol of that. Okay, Because these artworks... The only thing you can compare what these works did to you when you're sitting in the audience of a Greek tragedy is what wine does to you when you drink it. You see what I'm saying? That nobody ever talks about that either. Okay, but there's a direct correspondence there between the idea of Dionysus being the god of wine and what wine does to you. This is the best sense of it, you know, inebriates you in a way that you think of things out of the box, and this idea of having the privilege to sit in a theater in a city-state, which is the only place where such theaters exist at first. Later, of course, they build them all over the place. But you know, we're talking a good 50 years where this occurred. And this is the sweet spot of, of, of ancient Greek culture, we're talking about the classical period, around 50, a little more than 50 years um, after the Persian Wars. And, and Athens was exclusive when it came to all this. You know, they talk about TMZ with an exclusive. Well, that was Athens with what we're talking about here. They were the exclusive of, of all this, okay? And so Dionysus was the symbol of what was so special about what happens to you when you're one of the lucky ones who gets to come hundreds and hundreds of miles um, from whatever city-states you're sent from as an ambassador to come to Athens as a representative to pay the tribute and then, you know, get that over with so then you can go into the theater and experience kind of the um, cultural equivalent of drinking wine or even drinking wine and going to the theater. Who knows? Even nobody knows for sure about what was going on, how they prepared, whatever. Okay, but there was ritual involved. And I told you guys that Dionysus, just like the meter, was a god of mystery religion. And so there's a lot more to Dionysus um, when it comes to that as well. Unfortunately, because it's a mystery religion, those who were involved in the Dionysian mystery religion were a lot more successful at not leaking what happened in the mystery religions of Dion Dionysus, unlike the meter, where you have some general idea about what was going on in the Eleusinian mysteries. Okay? But that's the idea, so it's important for us to contextualize drama, theater, and, and tragedy historically in order to appreciate what was considered to be special about it. And also, let's get a little bit cynical here, also the, the political propagandistic function of creating a theater in order to convince everybody that it was a special thing for them to come to Athens each year. And not only was it a matter of convincing everybody from all over Greece that it was a giant deal to be able to come to Greece and experience these strategies, whatever, but here's the real kicker. Pericles also knew that this was the most ideal way to get a representative from each of the most important city-states in Greece to come and to sit in one place, 13,000 people in one place, okay, the theater of Dionysus, sitting there and what? Oh, by the way, before the play, Dionysus, uh, per frame slip, uh, Pericles has a little something to say to you for an hour. All right. That was the There was no Facebook yet. Right? There, was no, there was no way to do that. Think about it. Right? There was a marketplace, but if you ever go to a, a you know, farmer's market, try to say something to everybody. Right? You know? so, so marketplaces are chaotic. You know, we go to them now, the ruins, and we think, oh, marketplaces, you just sit there like Solon and sing you know, orations to, to everybody. No, you needed a place where everybody was wrapped in attention and listening to what was being said by this one person. And what was being said, no one knows for sure. But the point is that, that Pericles had that power to talk to 13,000 people at one time in a way that no one in all of Greece had. And that made a big difference, apparently. Yeah, that made a big um, difference propagandistically to be able to deliver a message to what? In Athens alone, there were 100,000, at the height of Athenian history, 100,000 citizens. Okay, so, you, so eight performances like that, or so, whatever the math is, and you had everybody. So, you know, you try that with, what do we do, even Academy Awards. How many people watch Academy Awards, right? There's no, nothing in comparison. Super Bowl, how many people watch it? Ish, right? But it's probably nothing compared to everybody in the world, right? As far as Athens was concerned, they were the center of the world. Okay, they were the center of what? They were the center of Greece. And as far as they were concerned, Greece was the center, was the world. Okay? 
Egypt was made fun of, there's everything's backwards there, you know, Mesopotamia, they're, you know, they're barbarians, blah, blah, blah. It was all about Greece, and it was all about Athens within Greece, and it was all about the ability to get just about all of Athens in the seats of just a few performances in the theater and to convey to them whatever message you want to convey to them in a way that was unprecedented. So that's the last thing today, is just realize that, yeah, there was a genre of literature that was developed in order to convince the people that it was a privilege to come each year, pay tribute to Athens in order for to, to be protected from foreign enemies and future wars, but also the ability to convey one message, whatever that message may be, to everybody in a way that you can't even do on Facebook. Try it on Twitter. Try it on anything that we have today. So there's the irony. There's the irony that proportionately, the theater of Dionysus was a much more powerful communicational technology than Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat put together. Try to get everybody in one place listening to one thing on those platforms. It never happens.